device. Good evening. Welcome to evening prayer on this August 11th. Today in our church calendar is the Feast of St. Clair of Assisi. Uh, being a lifelong Lutheran, celebrating the lives of saints is something that's foreign to me. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Clare in the, the reflection on things this evening, but Clare, uh, some things about Clare's life and writing spoke to me, and we'll, we'll get to that. But Clare is in our church calendar, in the Lutheran church calendar, as someone who we commemorate, and this August 11th is her day. If you're joining us on YouTube, the link will be in the video description below. I invite you to join along with me. God is our light and our salvation our refuge and our stronghold. From the rising of the sun to its setting, we praise your name, O God. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light we see light. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you called light into being and you set light in the sky to govern night and day. In a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, you led your people into freedom. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful and you love your whole creation. And with all your creatures, we give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So I had intended to chant this. If you feel safe doing it here in person, we will do this. I'm, I'm going to pick a tone, whatever note I start on is the key we're in. Um, and I, I will do the plain text. I invite you to join me in the bold text if you feel so bold to do so. O oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens, out of the mouths of infants and children. You have set up a fortress against your enemies to silence the foe and avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars you have set in their courses, what are mere mortals that you should be mindful of them, human beings that you should care for them? Yet you have made them little less than divine. With glory and honor you crown them. You have made them rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all flocks and cattle, even the wild beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic in your name is your name in all the earth. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Paul writes, It is necessary to boast. Nothing is to be gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me, 
even considering the exceptional character of the revelations. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord that about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, and persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Word of God, word of life. This reading from 2 Corinthians uh, is, is Paul, I think, and I'm not alone in this, but is, is Paul referring to himself in the third person. I'm not going to brag about people who have mystical experiences. Now, I know a guy, not going to say who, but he's kind of very loudly pointing at himself, who has had visions where he's been taken up into the third heaven. And I, I don't know for sure, but... He, he saw paradise and heard things that can't be uttered. But I'm not going to brag about that, even though it was better than anything you've ever experienced. Because for Paul, the point is not how great his spiritual experiences are. His church in Corinth has people who are visiting that church and who are, are involved in that church. And Paul refers to these people as super apostles. They, they act like they've got some special revelation. They're, they're interesting. They're, they're more engaging speakers. Uh, they're more impressive physical specimens. By, by Paul's description of himself, he's kind of diminutive and might be pretty badly beaten up. Um, he, we'll get in, that's not neither here nor there for this evening, but he's not that attractive, and he knows it. Um, Paul is saying, th- these people they might look like they've got it and they might be way more interesting than I am, but their message is not authentic. Mine is. And if you wanted to brag, I've had way better spiritual experiences than they did. Uh, But that's not the point. The point is that God is made perfect in weakness. And so that's what Paul chooses to do. It's a text that we read this evening in the commemoration of St. Clair of Assisi, who is a mystic. Um, Maybe an odd choice for us, but but I think it it works. Um, Clair had visions, had mystical experiences. Clair was one of the first people to follow Francis of Assisi. Uh, I don't know exactly where she falls in the pecking order, but she's one of the first. There are a lot of legends about Clair and always questionable what the value is in sharing these because we don't know how true they are. But we do know that Claire wrote and that Claire founded an order uh, that is now still around today. Most people refer to them as the Poor Clares. Um, St. Claire was the patron saint of a number of things, including in 1958, someone decided she was the patron saint of television since she was supposed to be able to see things that happened at great distances, how she managed to be the patron of television, I don't know. Um, But she's remembered in some parts of the world as as the patron saint of good weather, sort of person that you would pray to. And in some cultures, um, people will bring gifts to the poor Claire's convent um, to pray for good weather for their wedding. So she she remains an important person there. Um, Not so much in Lutheranism. Why is she in the Lutheran calendar. Lutherans bristle at people who found monastic orders. I mean, in, the, in classic Lutheranism, accusing somebody of monasticism was like the ultimate insult because it, it smacked of the cloister that Luther himself had lived in, and Luther railed against monks. And so saying, you're, in, you're being monastic was like the ultimate insult. You're Catholic and There's nothing worse than that to 16th and 17th century Lutherans. Claire 
has mystical experiences and Claire writes powerful mystical writings to other people, but she tells us something about mundane life and why we have spiritual practices. And I think that's, you know, in studying her in preparation for this evening, that's why she's worth commemorating. Um, Claire has some letters that she writes to Agnes of Prague. Agnes is the daughter of a king of Bohemia, and then as later is the sister of the next king of Bohemia. Uh, and Agnes gives up her life as being a princess who would be married off in a dynastic marriage uh, to follow this way of poverty that Claire has chosen for herself um, in the same vein as what Fra St. Francis did. Where Francis could travel and his male followers could travel and preach, Claire uh, called people into a cloistered life. It was safer for women to cloister rather than to try to travel uh, the roads of medieval Europe. And so that the work was much more in-house than being out and about, but was still important. This is from Claire's third letter to Agnes, or at least what we number as her third letter to Agnes. I am speaking about the Son of the Most High, to whom the Virgin gave birth, and after whose birth she remained a virgin. May you cling to his most sweet mother, who gave birth to the kind of son whom the heavens could not contain. And yet she carried him in the tiny enclosure of her sacred womb and held him on her young girl's lap. Who would not abhor the treachery of the enemy of humanity who, by means of the pride that results from fleeting and false glories, compels that which is greater than heaven to return to nothingness. See, it is already clear that the soul of a faithful person, the most worthy of God's creations through the grace of God, is greater than heaven, since the heavens and the rest of creation together cannot contain their creator, and only the soul of a faithful person in his dwelling place and throne, and this is possible only through the charity of that wicked lack. For the truth says, the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I shall love him, and we shall come to him and make our dwelling place with him. So just as the glorious virgin of virgins carried him physically, so you too, following in her footsteps, especially those of humility and poverty, can without any doubt always carry him spiritually in your chaste and virginal body, containing him by whom both you and all things are contained, and possessing that which, even when compared with the other transitory possessions of this world, you will possess more securely. Regarding this, some kings and queens of this world are deceived, even though in their pride they've climbed all the way up to the sky and their heads have touched the clouds. In the end, they are destroyed like a pile of dung. Mystical senses here, powerful words, the idea that you can contain within you that which contains you, this sort of impossible speech and this this repetitive pleading, almost preaching through a letter, speaks of mysticism and, and evokes a powerful sense to me. But then Claire shifts gears. <laughs> now I thought that I should respond to your charity about the things that you've asked me to clarify for you. And this is where Claire's letter gets very mundane. Namely, what were the feasts? And I imagine that you've perhaps figured this out to some extent, that our most glorious father, St. Francis, urged us to celebrate in a special way with different kinds of foods. Here's where the Lutherans would begin bristling. I now you're going to get down to monasticism and it's wrong. And Claire writes, Indeed, your prudence knows that with exception of the weak and the sick, for whom he advised and authorized 
to use every possible discretion with respect to any foods whatsoever, none of us who are healthy and strong ought to eat anything other than Lenten fare on both ordinary days and feast days, fasting every day except Sundays, and on the Lord's Nativity, when we ought to eat twice a day. And on Thursdays in ordinary time, fasting should reflect the personal decision of each sister, so that whoever might not wish to fast would not be obligated to do so. All the same, those of us who are healthy fast every day except Sundays and Christmas. Certainly during the entire Easter week, as blessed Francis states in what he has written, and on the feasts of Holy Mary and the Apostles, we are also not obliged to fast, unless these are feasts that should fall on a Friday. And as has already been said, we who are healthy and strong always eat Lenten fare. But because neither is our flesh the flesh of bronze, nor our strength the strength of stone, but instead we are frail and prone to every bodily weakness, I am asking and begging in the Lord that you be restrained wisely, dearest one, and discreetly from the indiscreet and impossibly severe fasting that I know you've imposed upon yourself, so that living you might profess the Lord and might return to the Lord your reasonable worship and your sacrifice always seasoned with salt. Stay well, always in the Lord, just as I very much desire to stay well and be sure to remember both me and my sisters in your holy prayers. Ultimately, for Claire, fasting is a spiritual practice that can bear much fruit, but the health and well-being of the human being is more important. And while fasting has its place in our spiritual disciplines, for many of us, eat, be healthy, she says, and don't be overly difficult on yourself. There is a great deal of grace in what Claire has to offer and a great deal of wisdom in finding the practices that help us feel closer to God. Fasting, such as we we eat only what we need, Lenten fare, the simplest food, helps us appreciate those who don't have as much or guarantees that those who maybe don't have the buying power we do could have enough. Likewise, eating a double portion on the big festival days, that's for people who are obsessed with fasting, that's hard. (laughs) Throughout the church's history, the church has basically had to command people to be happy at Easter for crying out loud, celebrate. Jesus is risen, it's kind of a big deal. Claire urges us to enjoy life when it is appropriate, to share life at all times, and to look out for the livelihoods of ourselves and those around us. For a mystic, one who can claim experiences far beyond what I have most of the time, her mundane advice is also very impressive. And so today we remember St. Clair, and I hope that my reflection might speak to you in some way, as I had to learn about someone whose name I knew for many years, but about whom I knew very little. We will continue with our hymn. There's a couple introductory sentences. The tune to our hymn is perhaps familiar to many of you as an Advent song. The lyrics are about praise of God. They're they're ones that aren't familiar to me, but they're in the worship folder. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness is not overcoming. and thanks and adoration, Son of God, to you we give, for you chose to serve creation, 
died that sinners all might live. Dear Lord Jesus, guide my way. Faithful, let me day by day follow where your steps are leading. Find adventure, joys exceeding. Hold me ever in your keeping. Comfort me in pain and strife. Through my laughter and my weeping, left me to a nobler life. Draw my fervent love to you, constant hope and faith renew. In your birth, your life and passion, in your death and resurrection. Let us pray. God, our creator, you have ordered seed time and harvest, sunshine and rain. Give to all who work the land fair compensation for the work of their hands. Grant that the people of this and every nation may give thanks to you for food, drink, and all that sustains life. May we use with care the land and water from which these good things come and may honor the laborers who produce them. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, our Creator, by your holy prophet Jeremiah, you taught your ancient people to seek the welfare of the cities in which they lived. We commend our neighborhood of Valparaiso to your care, that it might be kept free from strife and decay. Give us strength of purpose and concern for others, that we may create here a community of justice and peace, where your will may be done, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Eternal God, bless all schools, colleges, and universities, especially our public and private schools, returning to school this week or next week, that they may be lively places for sound learning, new discovery, and the pursuit of wisdom, and that those who teach and those who learn may find you to be the source of all truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God of wisdom, your Son came among us as a teacher. Send your blessing on all who are engaged in the work of education. Give them clearness of vision and freshness of thought, and enable them so to train the hearts and minds of their students that they may grow in wisdom and be prepared to face the challenges of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord God, you have surrounded us with so great a cloud of witnesses. Grant that we, encouraged by the example of your servant, Claire, may persevere in the course that is set before us, and at the last, share in your eternal joy with all the saints in light, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being with us this evening. We'll see you again soon.